Sigmund Freud has been hovering over this entire unit. His pathbreaking work ignited artist determination to explore the inner world of the psyche and gave them a new freedom to portray sexual themes more openly. Max Ernst was one of the artists who moved from Dada to Surrealism. The painting in this slide has elements of both. Is a nightingale really threatening? That sounds like Dada. But it could also be a dreamscape because it was inspired by a fever dream that a much younger Max Ernst experienced while sick in bed with the measles. The interpretation of dreams was one of Freud's most famous and influential works, and dreams are central to Surrealism. Note, too, that the work is part painting, part sculpture, part collage. As synthetic cubists had already demonstrated, these categories are breaking down. The use of a real cabinet knob stuck into the painting likewise suggests the found objects beloved of Dada artists. Some surrealists try to get in touch with their subconscious through automatism, that is, trying to let their subconscious direct their painting without themselves taking active creative charge. Here's a work by Miro that employed automatism as well as traditional painting. Remember Arps collect collages of scattered paper? It's much the same idea. This is probably the most famous surrealist painting, although it's dropped off the list. The Museum of Modern Art's website notes that Salvador Dali frequently described his paintings as, quote, hand-painted dream photographs, unquote. He based this seaside landscape on the cliffs in his home region of Catalonia, Spain. The ants and the melting clocks are recognizable images that Dali, in the tradition of surrealism, placed in an unfamiliar context and rendered in an unfamiliar way. Time is the theme here, from the melting watches to the decay implied by the swarming ants. Dali explained that he painted this work, quote, to systematize confusion and thus to help discredit completely the world of reality. Again, to the surrealist, the subconscious was really more real than the real. Here's another example of a surrealist twist on art. This famous painting it's a realist painting of a couple praying, was enormously popular in France, where it was mostly seen as a lovely, sentimental scene of rural piety. But this painting spooked Salvador Dali. He thought there had to be something there. In fact, he insisted that this was a funeral scene, not a prayer ritual, and that the couple was actually mourning over their dead infant. At his insistence, the Louvre x-rayed the painting, and it turned out Dali was right. X-rays revealed a small coffin overpainted by the basket. Apparently, Millet had concluded that a basket would be more appealing to buyers than a dead body, or than a dead baby's body. And here's what Dali produced in response to a dream vision he had of the Millet painting. Now, be prepared to be either really intrigued or really creeped out. The Dali Museum collaborated with Disney Studios to produce a virtual reality experience of this painting. So here's a quick introductory YouTube clip. I'm showing you this not only because I think it's cool and I'm pretty sure you'll enjoy it, but also because I think this animation captures something of the dreamlike spirit of surrealism. And finally, a required work. This surrealist object was allegedly inspired by a conversation at a Paris cafe between Oppenheim and artist Pablo Picasso and Dora Meyer. Admiring Merritt Oppenheim's fur-covered bracelet, Picasso remarked that one could cover anything with fur, to which she replied, even this cup and saucer. Soon after, when she was asked by André Breton, the leader of surrealism, to participate in the first surrealist exhibition dedicated to objects, Oppenheim bought a teacup, saucer, and spoon at a department store and covered them with the fur of a Chinese gazelle. In this way, she transformed genteel items, traditionally associated with feminine decorum, into a sensuous, sexually punning set of tableware. Like so many of the works of art in this unit, this one seems, on the face of it, to be all about sex. I'll let you fill in the blanks about just what this might resemble. But as you learned, I hope, from your homework, there are other art historical interpretations of object, 
Maybe the work isn't so much about sex as about transforming an object into a symbol of something else, which, again, was a key element of surrealism. The artist herself, who was rather spooked by the powerful reaction to her work, explained that she was trying to explore the physicality of an object to imagine what it would be like to sip tea from fur. Whatever the underlying explanation for this work, it's clear that the work calls for psychological interpretation and therefore may say as much about the viewer's subconscious preoccupation as the artist's intent. Remember that surrealism is all about artists playing with our inner selves. This wasn't a work or an artist that I knew before it appeared on the list, which was my loss. This is now a new favorite. Still, I struggle with where to stick this painting into the unit. You'll see many similarities to Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, especially those mask-like faces. The jungle setting, created from color blocks, has an expressionist feel, a la Cezanne. And there's an element of political protest art as well. However, Lama is considered a surrealist painter, considered himself a surrealist painter, so I went with surrealism. Here's what the Museum of Modern Art says about this work, which is part of the museum's collection. Quote, in his desire to express the spirit of Afro-Cuban culture, in particular that of the uprooted Africans who brought their primitive culture, their magical religion with its mystical side, in close correspondence with nature, long sentence here, Lamb reinforces the surrealist aspect of this work. So who was he? Wilfredo Lam was born and raised in a village in a sugar farming province. His father was a Chinese immigrant. His mother was Afro-Cuban of slave descent. In his village, Lam was su surrounded by Afro-Cubans who practiced both Catholicism and the Santeria, which is a syncretic religion combining elements of Catholicism with African traditions. In the jungle, the presence of the woman horse, who in Afro-Cuban mysticism ref is, refers to a spirit in communication with the natural world. This mirrors Lamb's own confrontational dialogue with the so-called primitive interests expressed in advanced European painting. In other words, this is shamanism. This work sure checks a lot of college board boxes. So here's another Lamb painting that echoes both Picasso and the traditions of Cuban Santeria. The Tate Gallery offers this explanation. During both Santeria and related voodoo rituals, which Lam encountered in an extended visit to Haiti, the worshiper is allegedly possessed or ridden by a spirit. The influence of these ceremonies is, evidence with, is evident within Lam's work, which commonly depict mask-like faces and hybrid figures, including the horse-headed woman. Here's another jungle scene with magical animals. I think Lam's surreal side comes through even more clearly in this painting. So while I've emphasized the jungle's cubist, expressionist, and surrealist elements, this is also a work with a strong social and political message. I've circled here two sugarcane plants, plants that are not, in fact, native to the jungle. Cuba in the 1940s had an economy based on tourism and sugarcane. Cuba was the Las Vegas of its day, overrun by wealthy Americans eager to party. What happens in Havana stays in Havana. Cuba was also a plantation economy where Cubans, and especially Afro-Cubans, performed backbreaking labor in the sugarcane fields for low pay and under terrible conditions. Lam supported Castro's communist revolution. So in 1965, he was invited to paint this work for the Cuban presidential palace. I mentioned that Lam was a protege of Picasso's. We've seen a painting from Picasso's Blue Period in several of his Cubist works, but Picasso also spent several years painting surrealist works. So here's a painting that features the Minotaur from the Legends of Ancient Crete. Picasso had not been especially political during the years between World War I and World War II, but the Spanish Civil War changed all that. Oh, I wish we had more time for this painting. Many art history teachers were startled to discover that Guernica had dropped off the list. I hope you have time for a brief video clip, which also talks about the reaction against modernism in Nazi Germany and the Communist Soviet Union. Alas, we don't have time for Simon, Simon Schama's long, fascinating account of the creation of this work. But he made one comment I'd like to share. Picasso had led the charge for modernism against stale conventions of academy painting. Yet this 
One of his greatest and probably still his most famous painting was a history painting on the grand scale, but also in the modernist image, uh, idiom. And with this, we leave European modernist painting and sculpture and cross the Atlantic to consider a different art of the Americas.